you know, I had built this career and then it literally everything went away. I mean, like everything went away. I had sold the book to HarperCollins, worked on it for two years. And the day my book came out, I went to rehab and missed the whole book thing. And I went to a place called Karen. That was amazing. And they told me to take a year off from work, not come back to the city. Hey, can you share what was your bottom? What made you go to rehab? Yeah. I mean, I think I was like probably unprepared in some way for the success, which I think a lot of people are. And I had one Emmys and then sadly I lost my both my parents within a year. And I remember it's funny because I never like I didn't drink in high school. I wasn't really that guy. I just I remember it slowly kind of going off the, the track. I started to find what I would say was like my drug of choice. I did it and then I didn't do it again for nine months. And then I did it six months and then three months. And then at the end, it was just like, it's time to go. And so I went and I was in a relationship and that ended. And they had said like, we don't think you should go back to New York. And I didn't really know where to go because everything had sort of fallen apart. And I felt terrible because I had a, a writing partner who, you know, I remember I I remember someone saying to me, you're on page six, because there was something on page six about something like off the merry-go-round or something. And it was like Terrence Noonan is not promoting his book and got off the merry-go-round and like Harper Collins I gave some quote that was like, Terrence has decided to like spend time focusing on himself, which is like, Terrence has decided he's a mess and he's gonna go try and get better. And so, you know, I'm grateful because I'm sober today and I'm that's my number one priority. But um, it, it was, you know, I had built this career and then it literally everything went away. I, I mean, like everything went away. Apartment, partner, jobs, book crash. And I just, like start it over, like all over again. What do you think was in you that allowed you to start over again that didn't just go like, well, I just, I can't. I mean, how did you do it? I do have resilience. So I do think that, I don't know if everybody's as resilient as the other, but I do think I just do have a strong resilience. I think I'm, um, I think I'm like competitive. I think I'm like creative. I think I'm driven. So I went to Washington DC and I got a job at the local news maybe making, I don't even know, like fifth of what I was making. And um, I was the producer there and I just did it what I had to do. I remember I was like, I gotta get a job. And so I wrote letters to the three uh, stations, to the general manager and said, hey, my name is Terrence, I've won Emmys. Um, I don't know, something like, you're never gonna get the chance to hire someone like me, I'm in town for a year or something, I don't know, something like arrogant. Just I mean, getting out of rehab, I clearly didn't learn about having, like, <laughs> I didn't learn about being grateful and like humble. And I got a job at the CBS affiliate and I, that's how my first show was sold because I had said to someone, I need to order someone cupcakes. And I said, is there like a Magnolia in DC? And they said, a shop just opened called Georgetown Cupcake. It just opened. I went online and for some reason I looked at the about and it said two sisters, Sophie and Catherine, decided to open a bakery, gave up their jobs. And I was like, that's a show. And I called them, left them a message. We met at a Starbucks. We went to the wrong Starbucks, met. I shot with home video camera, me and Mark Finkelpearl, who was my producing partner on that. And then we decided we were gonna work on a show. And I said to them, I'll do your PR and marketing, never done it, to get you ready to have a show because we gotta build your traction. So they started going to like farmer's markets, then local news. And then because I had connections, I got them on Martha Stewart, which was like the big get and they had national exposure. We took home video, cut it together, went to TLC and got direct order, I think for like 10 episodes. That would be very hard to happen now because back then they were just buying actual series. Now it's such a long process. And so that was my first show I sold. Who would have known that I would have like gone through this, you know, this 
had to go to rehab, went to DC. I knew I was ready to come back to New York. I, my agent had stuck with me and Dr. Oz was launching and I said, I'll get a job there. And I applied for the supervising producer job and it came down to three people. I was in a parking lot about to get yogurt in DC. My agent called me and said, you didn't get it. And I remember saying to him, call them back. Just tell them I'll take a producer job. Like I'll do it. Just get me back to New York. If I get back to New York, I'll be okay. And they were like, Terrence is too experienced. He had been running shows. And I was like, just get me the job. And they did. And I moved back to New York and got a studio apartment. I think I had $7,000, which is a lot of money. But I think that I had like, that was what was left after working for a really long time. And I basically started over at age 37, like from scratch. I remember convincing the leasing agent because it was a studio apartment on 37th Street. I think it was $1,700 a month. I had $7,000 in the bank. And he was like, you don't really have enough money. And I'm like, I know, but you just have to trust me. And my, I remember no one in my family would co-sign the lease. No one I knew, which was better. They were just not gonna, it was like, you gotta do it on your own. If you wanna do it, we're not gonna like enable you if that's not the apartment you're supposed to have. And so I, I, I did it myself and I, you know, moved to that apartment and started working at the Dr. Oz show where people that I supervise were now supervising me. And- What was that like? I think I was so grateful at the time to be back in New York and back on a big show. Cause there were a lot of moments where I was like, it's over. Like I had my time. And then I think I was there two months maybe. And then I got promoted to a supervising producer. So I got promoted to the job I didn't get. And then, yeah, I stayed there for a couple of years. I mean, we did such fun, big stuff, big eventful. I did like Kansas City, Kansas versus Kansas City, Missouri, who can lose more weight? You know, I remember working at Dr. Oz and we sent a lot of people to rehab. And that was a, that was like a very hard one for me because I had felt very different things about it, which was, do I want to put this person's story on TV? But I also know a, it's their decision, right? I can't control someone. And B, I, I knew that they were gonna get free rehab. So there was just like, I knew that it was not just done without a purpose. I knew there was a purpose to try and get them to a better place. There's lots of ways to look at it. People could say you're exploiting them, but I've really never worked on anything where I felt like we walked into it trying to exploit someone. I just, because I've like had my own ups and downs and I wouldn't want anyone to like, you know, exploit me or exploit my family. And life is really hard. It's hard for everybody, you know? And so it's shows that can bring fun and joy and laughter. And then I like shows where we can like make a difference. Remember calling Hillary and saying to her, I think on day one, I said, when you're ready to make a change in the show, call me. Cause I knew it was the wrong show for him. I snuck over to see Anderson. <laughs> I remember that because it was a lot of people from Dr. Oz went to Anderson that I got the job. I went to Dr. Oz and I asked him to be let out of my contract to go and said, this was like an amazing opportunity. They went in as the co-executive producer, three EPs above me. Maybe I was there six months and everybody else had left. And then I became the executive producer of that. So, which was great. My favorite show I've ever done. Favorite talk show. It seems like he's a really nice guy. The best. I mean, first of all, he's the nicest person. He's so smart. He's just like easy and lovely and respectful. My friend, Adam Height, who now directs Drew Barrymore was my, was the director on that. And he lives up the street and I just saw him the other night for dinner. And we were talking about like, it was just such a show sort of before it's time, it was live and we had tweets and we had like sort of people were posting things and syndicated talk shows were taped. And we were like, no, we're going to do it live. Like we're going to figure it out. And we did we figured it out to go live four days a week. We would tape a second show on Thursdays, but that was sort of like a little bit ahead of its time. I love the topical stuff, the human interest and the people and the stories and the connections and Anderson really loved that. And that's when all the like reality really started to take off. So we had a family on called Seven Little Johnsons. They had written a letter to Anderson. We had them on and I was like, that's a show. And so I had a first look deal at Warner Brothers it, they, Hillary, again, my business partner, <laughs> turned it down. Somehow went to TLC and got picked up. And then the woman from TLC moved to own 
took it to own, which was not the right platform for that show, uh, got canceled. Sort of an amazing story. Got canceled after a year. And then I think probably two years later, TLC decided they wanted a companion show to Little People Big World. And then the show kind of resurfaced and went back on the air on TLC. I don't know that many shows that were canceled that came back that are now, you know, is now a staple of TLC. We're in the middle of airing season 11 now. We're already picked up for probably 12 and 13. I'm so happy for this family. They have such a nice life. They never had to do anything that was against who they are as a family. Like that was important to me. And even stepping back with Georgetown Cupcake and the show on TLC DC Cupcakes, they made it very clear. We're not gonna pretend fight. You're not gonna come home with us. These were things that were reported to them. Now I would say this to them, if they would have done that, would the show have probably been on many more years? Probably because but that was the commitment they made and that was the commitment they made to them and that was not the show that they wanted. And for people that are like thinking about ideas, watching ideas, like every production company is watching morning shows. Everyone looking for stories, looking for stories, reading Daily Mail, looking for stories. And so I thought to myself, wait, like I work at one of these shows. Why am I letting other people watch the show and take a show? It's harder to do as a sing, you know, as a person because you don't have a big production company. But that's where all that stuff is coming from. You talked about the little, the seven little Johnstons, and yeah. Yeah. one of the one of the things about TV I think is so great these days <clears throat> is that it um, it's kind of a platform for people who are not you know mainstream people to become much more uh, recognizable and accepted by people at home because they see them on TV, and that's one of the wonderful things about TV. So. You know, kudos to you for uh, seven little jobs. Uh, yeah, I think it normalized, you know, what what people might seem as abnormal. It's like gay people, you gay people in relationships. You got the same old problems that men straight people have. It's like they have the same problems and people want an inside look at what life is like for other people. Oh, you want to meet my dog? Come yes. on, meet my dog. <laughs> Nico, Nico was the mascot on Anderson. And oh. so he was on the show right and people would send us portraits and paintings and like so sweet of like my husband nico and i they'd make portraits and photos and watercolors and send us all the stuff but nico became the dog that um that all the celebrities would carry out oh what a face i had a show on the travel channel and Again, based around a guy who gave pizza tours. Like, I took the tour and I was like, this is a show. He gave tours of Brooklyn pizza shops and I took the tour, he's a character. And let's say I tried a bunch that didn't work. I mean, these have worked. I mean, I've been on shows that worked, didn't work, failed, succeeded, didn't make it anywhere, made it somewhere. While I've been doing all this, I always am like thinking about other stuff. Like, I just can't not, like my brain just like thinks. And I am, um, I got into like, I wanted to become an entrepreneur.